The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, October 4th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning majority report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown brooklyn usa on the program today greg iwinski member of the writers guild of america negotiating committee on the historic deal struck and soon perhaps to be ratified by the wga membership then mo tachik Investigations editor at the American Prospect on what we don't know about the FTC lawsuit against Amazon. Also on the program, Kevin McCarthy. Remember that guy? First speaker in the history of the country to be voted out of office. Meanwhile, the Republican House in total disarray as the fight to be the next speaker begins. 75,000 Kaiser Permanente hospital workers on strike across multiple states across the country. Biden administration to announce uh, some limited student debt relief for 125,000 borrowers worth $9 billion in debt as they continue to roll out their patchwork student debt relief programs. Meanwhile, day 18 of the UAW strike as the big three are starting to rack up losses. DOJ sues a firm over price collusion amongst meat processors. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Trump That's gets all. a. Meanwhile, Donald Trump gets a gag order in a uh, in his fraud case after attacking his judge's clerk. Hmm. New uh, Senate Foreign Relations Chair Ben Cardin blocks the uh, aid to Egyptian military in the wake of the Menendez indictments. Figure and what the hell's going on? September shattered global heat records for September by a record margin. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. It is hump day. It is, it is hump day. It, it is. is hump day. And it's a fun hump day. It's a fun hump day. Although, uh, just a word, we're going to say something about this in and when we head into the uh, fun half as well. But at 2.20 today, Eastern, uh, your phones will uh, signal, will, will have some type of like um, national emergency broadcast alert that used to be on television when I was a kid. And now it's going to be on the phones at 2.20 today by FEMA. Expect at that time that uh, most of us who have taken the boosters will turn into zombies. Right. I mean, as we are triggered. Um, and I wear my running shoes just in case I am lucky enough not to become a zombie. And in, in fact, I'm one of the survivors on the way home from work today. Attention so, Americans. Anyways, the point is, I just want to make people aware that the show, show could be 10 minutes short today. Oh, okay. So, yeah. I just wanted to make that clear. Because if we're zombies, we might not be able to know how to. Well, actually, it might be long because if we're zombies, we might not know how to be able to. No, tune in. Tune in to see us kind of just make our make our shift. The necks in our or the bones in our necks kind of crackle and break. We're and just going to get a little more green. A little more digital. Um, 
All right, let's get into this. Uh, yesterday, after the show, I live-streamed the uh, vote, and uh, there were three um, flippers. Do we know why they flipped? I don't have the list in front of me now. I have, it was. Um, I have the eight that voted, not the flippers. Okay, it was, it was Corey Mills, a freshman Republican from Florida, and Warren Davidson, Republican of Ohio, and um, Victoria Sparks, Republican of Indiana. So, I, but Corey Mills did respond to somebody. Um, I'll put his I'll, one second. I will put his tweet up here if you wanted to see why he um, didn't. Uh, well, we'll go into me. that later. Okay. But there were three defectors from the eleven who voted to uh, against the motion to table um it's unclear you know what happened i mean i we watched the uh did we, we watch watched it together the motion the, to table the motion to table and i think uh, and i don't know if we watched the um uh the arguments in favor it was mostly gates gates was uh mostly like having to do the argument uh, from the democratic uh podium mm -hmm. because the republicans wouldn't let him get to a microphone um He's pretty much hated in the uh, Republican caucus now, which is only a big deal if he wanted to actually achieve uh, anything beyond what he's done. And um, he probably doesn't. He's probably doing, uh, you know, brand building. And I think he's been quite successful at that. But let's watch uh, some of the key moments from the vote yesterday. On this vote, the yeas are 216. The nays are 210. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. So there you have that. And then the um, House pro temp uh, right? Is that is what it's called? Yeah. House Pro Temp uh, McHenry uh, took the gavel. So basically, you have an acting Speaker of the House. There is um, some controversy uh, because uh, the Republicans apparently uh, took away offices uh, that f uh, the House minority leaders generally have from uh, Hoyer and I guess Pelosi. I don't know why she still, frankly, had an office. I guess it was just a common courtesy to X speakers of the house apparently that's something they do to ex-speakers of the house when they're still in office they have an office in the capitol building so she's more able to easily do business as opposed to having her regular office i mean i don't care but i don't care either and, but it's but just still petty by them it was petty but what's also interesting it's unclear that whether the essentially acting speaker of the house has that authority uh to make those decisions pelosi's but, not in the building she's in california for feinstein's funeral so they're like trying to clear out oh, her they office did. when they she's did. not there they right. already did that and they did that with us uh, hoyers as well but nevertheless here is the uh acting um speaker of the house and uh, this is moments after the vote he was unhappy chair declares the house in recess subject to the call of the chair And he wanted to make sure everybody uh, saw that, and he was going to bang that gavel. That yeah. is that is a, a angry gavel banging. I'd cut it back like ten percent. Yeah, I got to be honest. If I if I had the gavel, I would be banging it like that all the time. See I wouldn't have done it, it just once. Oh I would just yeah, keep doing it. See if you can break it. It's like one of those carnival games. I'd be <laughs> knocking it like Neil Pert. Here's Kevin McCarthy uh, after the the vote, and um, uh, this is Kevin McCarthy. Um, one of the interesting things was in listening to the arguments as to why people were voting against him. Uh, Nancy Mace will play this a little bit later. The guy seems to be just, it was just one of those situations where you're lying to everybody about everything and they just all, all the lies ca catch up to you. Like this is, you know, this, it, like it, it's like a guy in survivor, uh, Honestly, uh, this seems like a ridiculous uh, example, but this is so blatant, it actually works. Who lies to everybody, and it, for a couple of rounds, they're doing okay. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, everybody realized, it's like, hey, they, wait a second. They compare notes. I thought <laughs> we were in a uh, coalition together, and uh, but here he is. Basically, the last lie we probably will be subjected to from Kevin McCarthy, because no one's going to pay any attention to him after this. My goals have not changed. 
amass power and wealth. My ability to fight is just in a different form. <laughs> <laughs> Lobbying Meaning soon. 218. Unfortunately, 4% of our conference can join all the Democrats a deal and I dictate made. who can be the Republican speaker in this house. I don't think that rule is good for the institution, but apparently I'm the only one. Pause nope, it. Pope, now here nope, is, here is what is amazing about that. <laughs> that rule exists only because he offered it as a way for him to achieve the yes. power that he wanted. He is Period. so End of power story. hungry that he there was 15 rounds of voting in January, right, in order to determine if he was House Speaker. It was took way longer. It was another historic moment of dysfunction in selecting a speaker. And to get the power he wanted, he conceded that authority, saying that anybody in his caucus or anybody could call up a motion to vacate the speaker and just hold a vote right away. So he's lying and saying, er, lying by omission at the very least, and calling it a bad deal that he doesn't like. You are the one that put it in place, you moron. Well, yes, I mean, he knows that. And it's just more an example of his, uh, his, 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 his ability to lie. But continue. The Republican speaker in this house. I don't think that rule is good for the institution, but apparently I'm the only one. I believe Just I can me. continue to fight, maybe in a different manner. I will not run for speaker again. Violin music. I'll have the conference pick somebody else. <laughs> oh, All right, and so uh, let's be clear. This is what uh, McCarthy's plan is. McCarthy's plan is to continue. Remember, he's uh, the biggest, one of the biggest fundraisers in the, uh, we, uh, probably the biggest fundraiser in Congress itself in the house at least for the republicans and um he's going to continue to fundraise he's not going to run for speaker he's not going to resign because he wants to continue to fundraise although although i would suspect if there is reason to believe that the republicans uh might lose their majority he might make a mad dash to k street now to cash in but more than likely he'll try and um, uh, fundraise for republicans he will do this with the hopes that they regain or they maintain uh the the house they probably won't and and he wants to maintain these relationships with the 200 uh, or so republicans who voted for him 205 or whatever it is and you know some he could have stayed in office had he made any type of deal with the Democrats and they made a lot of offers, apparently he wanted none of that. And I think part of the reason why he didn't, or I should say the reason why he didn't is because he knew that that would be unsustainable with his caucus. It would have been sh uh, short term kept him in office. Ultimately he would have been uh, voted out or would have had to resign. I don't know why he didn't resign when he saw it was quite obvious this was happening. And it would have soured his relationships with some percentage of the Republican caucus. And that those relationships is money to him. Yeah. He will go. There is, you know, I would bet everything I own. He's going to go into some lobbying firm. Or maybe, you know, some quasi think tank f lobbying firm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a front for lobbying. And he wants to make sure that there are 150 doors that he can knock on, 200 doors that he can knock on, having done them a favor. And that is value that he turns around and monetizes. Not unlike, you know, like, uh, I don't know, every other, uh, uh, you know. Not unlike Cantor, not unlike Ryan, not unlike the other young guns that were the uh, the the speakers of the, uh, of the House, the Republican leaders who were supposed to usher in this new hot era of conservatism, or tons of other you know, I mean, Democratic politicians. Sure, too. I mean, it happens but, all the time. But but it is just notable again the the fact that this is historic, the hallmark, uh, the the na the nature of how representative it is of dysfunction. I want to just a few quick things before we we get to to our guests. Just point out good test for Hakeem Jeffries. I might not like him on a political perspective, right? He's further to the right. The Israel stuff I don't like. But in terms of playing partisan, this guy's a liar. He won't drop the impeachment inquiry. He won't do any of the things that we say and won't speak to us in good faith. 
vote in tandem, keep the caucus together, vote yes on the motion to vacate. And that was engaging in partisanship in the right way. And two, now, like, it's going to be probably a dogfight between Scalise and Jim Jordan. Scalise is the guy that described himself reportedly as David Duke without the baggage. And Jim Jordan is the guy credibly accused of covering up sexual assault of wrestlers in o- at Ohio State. The best and the brightest of the Republican Party, those are the two guys they're going to bring to the fore. And just make, make uh, understand where they're at at this point. And don't root for anybody in this situation. Root for maximum chaos. And that's why yesterday was a good day. And it's good that Hakeem Jeffries understood the value of creating that chaos for them. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk uh, more about that later. I mean, there's never been a... Um, there's never been a Speaker of the House, I think, elected, at least in, in, in decades that uh, received any votes from the opposite party. Um, And, you know, apparently uh, some of the problem solvers are talking about, the Republican problem solvers are talking about uh, getting out of their problem-solving caucus because Uh their Democratic friends wouldn't vote with them. But we got a lot more to talk about that. And also, you know, um, uh, in terms of of, uh, Jim Jordan, tradition... I mean, I, this happened during the aughts when you had a series of uh, of um, of speakers having to step down in a row. Um, Bob Livingston was up for speaker, and then he had to ju- uh, step down after uh, Newt mm-hmm. Gingrich uh, after the impeachment of, of Clinton because he he had an affair and it was going to come out in Hustler, and so he had to step down. And that's how uh, we got Denny Hastert. And if tradition in the Republican Party is. That when you lose a speaker, you go to a guy who has been involved in wrestling mm-hmm. and uh, um, a molestation of children. That's what Denny Hastert uh, was. And so, I don't know. We'll see if they maintain that tradition. Oh, beautiful. But um, in the meantime... Uh, Santos we, for speaker, baby. That's we're what going I'm to, for. Uh, We're going to... Uh, be talking to Greg Iwinski, I- a uh, member of the Writers Guild of American Negotiating Committee, in just a moment. But first, a word from uh, one of our sponsors. Uh, folks, if you can believe it, it's already October, which means that if you are a business, you got to be starting to think about the holiday season. Right? Right. Now, uh, for me, like um, personally, Hanukkah's uh, earlier this year. I'm not going to be uh, caught up in the whole gift giving guide mm-hmm. at the end of this net. But if you're selling stuff, for instance, like on our merch uh, um, uh, store, we're starting to think more about like maybe some special stuff. Mm. Um, but the holiday rush means more mailing and shipping for your business. But it doesn't have to mean more stress. How do you avoid that? Stamps.com. They've been helping businesses like yours. And uh, back when I was sending out DVDs, um, Mine for over 25 years. They help you save uh, time and money. All you need is stamps.com's premium rates for all of your postage needs. Stamps.com is like your own personal post office. It doesn't matter where you are or frankly, when you are. Yes, 24-7, 365. All you need is a computer and a printer. And with stamps.com, you can print out uh, postage They will also send you a free scale so you can get started. Um, They also have a mobile app now, stamps.com mobile app. If you need to arrange a package pickup, you're walking home from work, you're walking away from work, you're commuting, you schedule it uh, through your stamps.com dashboard or app. Um, If you sell products online, stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Stamps.com, like I say, also offers premium discounts and supplies at your fingertips. So if you're running uh, low on shipping and mailing supplies or labels or even printers, you get it from their supply store. They also, and this is huge, give you huge uh, carrier discounts, 84% off of U.S. postal service rates and, uh, and up to 84% on U- UPS rates. That, of course, um, that's huge for you. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options uh, all in one dashboard. Stamps.com has been your postage partner, again, for 25 years. They have been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Get access to the USPS and UPS services you need right now. 
from your computer anytime. You want to wake up, you want to start to ship stuff at uh, 2 in the morning, get up, put it on their free scale, pump out the uh, postage, and um, schedule your pickup, go back to sleep. And then, uh, I don't know. Bingo, bango. Bingo, bango. Um, it's, uh, and now, if you sign up with the promo code Majority Report, you will get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. There's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, enter the code majority report. Also, one of our sponsors today, uh, one of my favorite uh, products, actually, that, that we have, um, Henson Shaving. Henson Shaving is a family-owned aerospace parts manufacturer that has made parts for the International Space Station and the uh, Mars rover. And now they have turned their uh, machinery and their computer numerical control machines to making this. It is the best razor you will ever own and very well could be the last razor you ever own. So it turns out that the reason why people experience discomfort when they shave is because not because the blade is dull, although you want a you want a sharp blade, but you know sharpening blades not that difficult. The difficult part is making sure that the blade does not protrude too far from the actual razor, creating too much bounce. And so, uh, what Henson shaving is able to be be able to do, they make these metal razors that extend just 0. .0013 inches, less than the thickness of a human hair. That means it's a secure and stable blade and it gives you a vibration free shave. Plus this has uh, channels built in here to evacuate hair and um, shaving cream. So you don't have to bang it on your sink or wipe it with your thumb, God forbid, and cut your fingers. I don't like that. Um, Henson shaving. And this is, this is the part that I really like about it because right now all I'm doing is this. I'm mm -hmm. doing this. Basically that's it. And a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but not much. Uh, and the beauty is they have, uh, they, they set out to make the best razor, not necessarily the best razor business. And by that, I mean, they, they don't have a subscription service. There is no obsolescence. There is no proprietiness on the blades. You buy this razor once, and then it costs you about three to $5 a year because it uses those standard dual edge blades. And that's it. Three to five a year. And you've got yourself a beautiful razor. They've got a couple of different colors. They've got a couple of different styles. Uh, amazing. Um, again, once you own this razor, three to five dollars a year, it's going to cost you to shave. Um, but they're giving our audience a two-year supply of blades for free. Just go to hensonshaving.com slash majority. That's H-E-N-S-O-N shaving.com slash majority. Add a razor, and then you got to take a hundred uh, pack of razor blades, put it into the uh, cart, enter the code majority, get the blades for free. The link is in the podcast and YouTube description. All right, quick break. And um, we'll be back with Greg Iwinski, member of the Writers Guild of America Negotiating Committee. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us now, Greg Iwinski, member of the Writers Guild of America Negotiating Committee. Uh, Greg, welcome back. I think the last time we talked to you, you were on the picket lines. Yeah, I think we were uh, outside of uh, Warner Brothers Discovery Office uh, on, at Hudson Yards, and I was yelling over the street noise. So this is a much <laughs> calmer interview. 
Well, uh, first off, uh, congratulations. Yes. Um, and the 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 contract has yet to be ratified by the WGA members. Is that right? It's it, it's uh, it, the voting is is already started. Yeah, voting is uh, from October second to 9th. so uh, it's a week of voting. So um, we'll know the ratification fairly soon after that. But um, yeah, but everybody seems to everybody seems to expect that it's going to be ratified by the membership. Um, the um, there are sort of like a the 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 WGE a East and West have uh, okayed at least the um, uh, the the leadership. Is that right? Yeah, I think uh, part of what the negotiating committee felt was we had there was so much leverage from the membership staying out on the lines, even that last week of negotiating. But that also meant that we knew that the contract we brought them had to be something that people would accept. Uh, so I, I think I think negotiating committee wouldn't have come out of there with something that we thought wouldn't be ratified. All right. Let's talk about, um, uh, you know, the uh, what you guys ended up uh, getting, because, I mean, it's been called historical and we're at a really weird inflection point for uh, the industry, um, the the entertainment industry, from my my perspective, anyways, um, one that I think is going to be, um, you know, I, I'm not terribly enthused about where all this is heading, but in terms of like protecting the writers, it seems like you guys did a pretty good job. Can you walk us through um, sort of the, 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 the gets that you got, the big ones? Yeah, I, I want to talk just for a second, though, about those two, the moment you're talking about, because there is a lot of buzz about where are we in entertainment. There's a contraction. Things might get smaller. We're post-peak TV. There are two moments happening at once. There is a, a rising labor movement and a push for the dignity of our work at the same time as a contraction. And those aren't the same movement. There are two giant moves happening in the industry concurrently, but but one didn't cause the other. I, I'm not. I don't believe so. You know, I don't think our fair contract is going to cause the industry to shrink. But if it does, uh, it's good that we have good contracts. Yeah. yeah, no, it didn't cause one didn't cause the other. What caused it was these corporations feeling like they needed to get in on streaming and it being like the new hot thing to do, essentially. And honestly, what may, may cause this contraction is the fact that they exploited the fact that they were able to uh, use writers and actors without paying them fairly for these streaming platforms. And that's what caused this rapid expansion where people aren't consuming the content in the way that they um anticipated is that a fair assessment yeah i think there was this over leveraged pursuit of the kind of infinite buffet model that requires you to slash labor like with most tech disruptors you know you have to slash labor protections and they built a model that won't work with fair labor costs at the same time they also just realized it seems like everyone chased netflix and then all at the same time realized that isn't actually a model that works we've had a model that works for a long time you make popular shows you sell commercials you know, you, well, you profit. I mean, that's that. That's actually where my uh, concern comes from. And again, I, this is not a function of, of labor costs at all. It is they broke the model. And the model used to be in television, long tail, right? It was all syndication is where all everybody made their money. That's where the studios made their money. That's where the actors and writers made their money. Show gets bought, goes into uh, syndication, and that pays dividends that model was broken by uh, by streaming, essentially. And now some of them, it seems like, uh, I think Amazon announced this and Netflix has sort of been playing around with it, are trying to go back to the ad-supported model uh, as a way of driving. Uh, uh, and that's, that, that's not going to work. I mean, I look at my son and it's like the idea of him looking at, at commercials in that way, he's like, no way. <laughs> He'll watch, he'll just watch somebody, you know, comment on other people's videos on YouTube before he does that. And, and I guess my concern, uh, and it, it's unrelated to, you know, what was negotiated, but I guess we're here now, is the, that model is largely, like, the success of that model is important to the old Hollywood entities. But for Amazon and for Apple, the entertainment divisions they have is such a small part of their massive business. They're just using it to scrape data largely. And so at the end of the day, and I don't know if this is five years out or 10 years out, they're just going to function like any other tech company and be like, we don't care. 
<laughs> like they don't they're not gonna care yeah, about well, like the, the humans kind of, the end of it. there's two things to that one is that you saw that right after our deal there was this streaming trade alliance announced to lobby dc that was the streaming companies apple and amazon weren't part of it it was the other companies i think right. that the division has been made so clear about people who make tv as their product and people who make it as advertisement i don't i don't really know but the other thing is about uh, there's a couple things about the idea oh the mod if we go back to the model if you watch youtube you sit through ads right if you scroll through your instagram feed you flip through ads if you are like if you are on twitter you're scrolling past ads everyone is going past ads all the time the idea that anyone is living in an ad free space is just not where we're at and also uh, most people don't watch media the same way when they're 16 and 36. All right. of us change and grow and move and we get more sedentary and we just want something at the end of a long, hard day <laughs> instead of when I was 16 and I was watching late night at 1.30 in the morning. So I, I think that uh, the, the model works financially, but also um, we still haven't proven that, it, that, that it's that broken. It was a shiny object to chase streaming, but you come back to it and you look at like a CBS crime procedural that has 4 million people watch it, you know, yeah. every, every week. So I, I do think that, that we are coming back to a model. Maybe it's going to be AVOD, which is uh, advertising video on demand, no subscription fee. You just watch it like it's a cable thing, a place that the, the Writers Guild won terms in this contract. So now you can get paid fairly for that. Maybe it'll be that, like a fast service uh, you know, or maybe it will be uh, just more streaming and longer seasons. I think that the networks, the studios, the streamers have learned it actually is great if you have a hit, if you make it longer. Like you're talking about a long tail. I don't have to find three hits if I can make one show as long as those three would have been. Right. 16 episodes, 18 episodes. And I think you are seeing that start to come down the pipe of going, oh, if we put it out once a week and there's commercials in it and it builds buzz and it's 13 or yes. 16 or 18 long, we actually can make a bunch of money. And they are rediscovering a model that we've been telling them has worked the whole time. And, well, and, and I will say, you know, uh, we have uh, um, uh, Mo Tatsik uh, coming on about the Amazon lawsuit that the FTC is bringing. And I think ultimately the entertainment industry is going to is going to, to exist in the in, in, in some facsimile as we know it is going to have to be protected uh, by essentially um, pulling Apple and Amazon uh, apart in many ways so that they don't have the ability to sort of like the entertainment part of what they're doing is really just another way of getting people onto their devices for other things or scraping data so that they can sell ads on other places. I mean, that, that relationship, there's going to have to be some version it seems to me of the uh sin fin laws that were um uh, uh, uh destroyed now 30 years ago i guess close 27 years ago um is gonna there that's gonna have to be some type of model uh in the way that we deal with the tech element within this business but let's get to some of the big uh, terms that, that that you guys uh were able to secure for writers yeah, I mean, w w one of the things I'm most proud of in this deal is that we did not leave any kind of writer behind. Uh, so screenwriters got guaranteed two-step deals. What that means is if you sell a movie, you're going to write a movie, you get a rewrite, which not only is a chance to get paid more, but it also is a chance for you to prove that you can take the notes of the studio and address them and do a second draft and prove that you can do the job. You know, it's not just I wrote one thing, I hope you guys like it, here it is. Um, you, you're getting another chance. You're getting a rewrite uh, on that, which is something that's been asked for for a long time. Also, accelerated pay. So, you know, they're not waiting for it, getting half the money up front and then half the money at the end, and it's being dangled over your head when you're trying to write a movie. So we address screenwriters for that. For my place in Appendix A, late night writers and game show writers and daytime writers had no pay protections in streaming. And we won those pay protections, you know, that now if The Tonight Show moves to Peacock or if we make a new sketch show on Netflix, it pays like it would on television. And that uh, was an incredibly important thing for us in Appendix A. And, and then for, for episodic television, I mean, the, we defended the writer's room, the idea that a writer's room exists. It takes writers to make a show. It takes a certain number of them to make a show, um, getting, our, getting uh, better pay for higher tiers of, of workers 
um, we just we got a ton for a, a lot of people, and that's what's great is that there isn't one giant victory that came out of this. It's it's across the board. Everyone got something in that appendix A, and and I think this is this is one of the questions I had about um, um, a, a couple of the provisions. There are there are categories in which you become eligible for this type of stuff that is a function of the budgets of the shows. And, um, uh, go into that a little bit, uh, for us, because, you know, some of those budgets seem to me to be like, this is, there, there's a bit of a thread of a needle there. Right. And, um, and, and I'm curious about that. Well, we, um, took a lot of time, uh, talking to a lot of people who are responsible for those budgets on the shows that do exist, um, to really talk with them about it. If these numbers were something that we could be okay hitting. Uh, and I think a large breaking point from that was originally coming in and saying, setting these very high breaks. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to dogpile on the studios after they already lost, but I don't know that they truly, the people in that room truly understood how late night worked. Um, so having to get a lower budget break for, say, a strip show, a show that's on five times a week, that's actually much cheaper to make than a show that's once a week because you just are coming back out to the same set. Um, and so getting a lower budget break there, uh, but, but we work really hard to talk to people who are, are making and have made shows to make sure that we weren't creating a false victory where there were budget breaks that nobody could hit. All right, good. And, um, the, uh, the other question I had was about the sort of like the, the residuals for, I guess, top performing shows, uh, divine by 20%. Go into that because that to me is like sort of, there's a, there, it's it's interesting. There's still these trade secrets about how many people are, uh, you know, watching these things to get a show in the top 20%. My understanding is that like six people in the guild will get this data. It will come in different forms depending on the streaming outlet. And it's going to be like, like some type of like star chamber where they can't, where they can't tell anybody else what these numbers are. But I think the theory is with the with the guild is that they're going to have a sense of what the numbers are. So for future negotiations, we're going to have a better notion of like what the cutoffs should be, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to say about this. I'll try to say it quickly. Um, the 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 model that they 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 told us that they would never do this. This was an across the table. We've never paid for performance. We never will. It will never happen. Even in August when they met with us, they offered us this six person transparency window and nothing else. And then when they realized that the guild was not going to break, we finally in that last week got got this model, which can be built upon. You know, we have breached the concept of getting paid for your show being a hit on streaming. So now it, that 20%, maybe there's a 10% tier and a 30 and a 40% tier. And the payment changes with how much, if, if I get 80% of your audience to watch something, I feel like I should get a pretty big bonus. Um, but the, the math of it is really, it's, the, it's just to get into it, is it's the number of minutes that it's watched divided by the length of the show. And they say, okay, it was watched this many times. So if one person watches it three times, that counts as three people. It does not have to be 20% of the unique accounts watch it. It's just that that's so we can have a specific number target that a writer or someone can know because these studios go out in the press and they say, oh, our new hit show had 400 million minutes viewed. And if you're the writer, even without them being totally transparent, you can go, oh, well, I know that that thing, I know that I hit it. Um, I think that we have tried to get transparency, but it's also not only on the Writers Guild to get transparency for Hollywood. Hopefully SAG and these other unions keep cracking it open. Hopefully advertisers crack it open. It is unrealistic to think that for three or five or 10 years, they can keep it this under wraps, you know, but yes, we will have the data provided to us as one data point. We'll have what they say in the press as another data point. And we have the ability because it's contract language to audit it, have an independent auditor for these numbers. So we have several data points to triangulate, to make sure that the numbers are the numbers. And then from there, we can see how we want to uh, pitch adjusting this model. Was there any, like, you know, one of the things that I, 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 I that, that still sort of sticks with me is that is the, is the uh, that is somewhat problematic about the 20 percent model aside from like the sort of lack of transparency and the sort of everybody's delivering different types of numbers etc cetera, etc cetera, um that you know to me the streaming stuff is like you're filling a pond you're stocking a pond with fish and somebody's casting their line in there and they're, they're going to pull some out but 
The reason why they're able to pull those out is because there's so many fish in there, right? Like the, the, you know, it's not like old style TV where there's one thing on at a time. This is, there's a choice of five things or 10 things or 30 things that people are going to watch. And that choice is what also brings value to that streaming platform. And it feels like the people creating the content are not participating in just the sort of like volume, the benefit of volume being on these platforms. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there, this is just a, a personal artistic opinion, but I think that scarcity and curation have value to an audience. I think part of the thing that we like about network TV or cable TV is, I think about it like a real regular American. I don't want to use that in any politicized term, but like work was hard. I got home. I turn. I got my kids to sleep. I don't want to pick. I'm going to mm. turn it on and what's on. And that's the reason that we go and we watch a movie halfway through that we've seen a million times when it's on cable. It's on. It's presented to us. It's a lean back experience. And I think that we are moving that way because I think audiences are fatigued with having to scroll through eight apps and each app has 400 choices and you don't know what you want to watch and everything is a cliffhanger and you just kind of want to sit down and go, I'm going to sit down for an hour. I'm going to watch a story with somebody I like and then I'm going to go, that was great. I'm done. I'm going to sleep. I have to go to work tomorrow. So I think we are moving back towards curation and that, and that as part of that contraction or smaller pool. But that also the less fish in the pond, the easier it is to be that 20%, you right. know? So right. I think we, it moves us towards that, that anyway, when the, you know, I think the fear that, that you hear about that's all these numbers are so mysterious, but are we already in a situation where for some of these streamers, only the top couple shows even get watched? We don't know. Right. And yeah, which stinks I, for the creators and for the audience, you know, but, but we don't, we don't know. So we already could be in a place where there's like five giant bass and a bunch of tiny goldfish. We don't, we're not sure. Well, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, it was great to see the level of solidarity. I mean, I, I think maybe we talked about this when, when we were on the, the picket lines, but uh, I was a member of the WGA back in uh, 07 or 08, and it really feels like the level of solidarity much higher uh, this time around than last time around. I mean, I you know, I, it's reflective in society at large, but it was not just between SAG and WGA, but uh, which is also, I think, a, a sort of a new phenomena. But within the uh, WGA, um, there was a lot more sort of, I think, at the very least, public. And I think even like, you know, from what I understand, even like sort of like uh, 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 behind the scenes solidarity. I mean, it, it was in the, from the neg calm down, there was unity. And, and somebody asked me, uh, you know, a couple months ago, how is the how are you able to go so long? And I think it's a real... Uh, example of practicing the values you preach the, the the people who had more in our guild gave to the people who didn't have enough so they could keep going in the fight that's why you had showrunners donate forty thousand dollars of grocery gift cards at a picket you know that's why we had the green envelope grocery fund and we had the aid funds and we had the strike funds and we had the ecf was so that the people who said look we have money and we have resources and we will use those to help the people who don't have anything so all of us together can stay in the fight it was real solidarity even inside the guild and because of that everybody won that's great uh greg uh Iwinski, thank you so much for your time today really appreciate it thank you Thanks. all right folks we're going to take a quick break and when we come back uh we'll be talking to uh mo tactic um investigations editor at the american prospect on what we know so far about this uh amazon uh lawsuit from uh from the uh FTC. ftc um it's a weird way to put it but it's also there's a lot of redactions we'll be right back after this We are back, Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It's a pleasure to welcome back to the program Mo Tatsik. She's a uh, the investigations editor 
the American Prospect at prospect.org. Uh, Mo, uh, welcome back to the program. The FTC has filed suit along with 17, uh, I think it is, uh, states uh, against Amazon. And um, for basically two, it seems to me, there's, there's two ac major accusations. Uh, the first is that the company is preventing sellers from offering lower prices on other retail sites um, by basically saying, we're going to shut off your ability to sell on Amazon more or less. We're going to make it very difficult. And the other is that Amazon is also uses their, uh, their heft to, um, to prevent other people from providing fulfillment in terms of shipping. Are there, is, do I have that right? Are there other, uh, are there other aspects to this suit? Um, I think that's a pretty good assessment. Um, one of the things that is, I think, specifically um, pretty insidious about the way Amazon works is that um, if you're a, a third party seller on Amazon and 60% of the goods bought and sold on Amazon are um, sold by third party sellers, um, you have a... Uh, you have to give a, a larger and larger portion of your revenue to Amazon. Um, at this point, it's 45% or 50%, 40, between 45 and 52% um, of your gross that goes just straight to Amazon for all of their fees and, um, <laughs> and advertising and the, the whole litany of fees. Um, this was set 19% not too long ago. I think it was 30% um, during the pandemic and 30% was pretty high. Um, but uh, 45, 50 percent is um, is 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 really cutting into um, a lot of uh, small businesses ability to, to you know, be sustainable. And so, of course, they would love to sell um, their their goods on competing marketplaces, whether it's Walmart or eBay or, God, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was something <laughs> slightly less evil? Um they cannot, however, try to uh, induce their customers to go somewhere else. Um, oh, also their own Shopify sites. That's a that's another thing. A lot of um, a lot of small um, businesses have their own um, Shopify sites, and that al allows them to actually collect data on their um, customers, kind of figure out, um, you know, know where they live, send them um, promotions, etc. Um, they are not allowed to charge less uh, to those customers who go out of their way to uh, buy from them on um, Shopify than um, than they do on Amazon. Um, well, this used to be a contractual obligation of an Amazon seller. Um, in 2019, they lifted that knowing, I think, that they were under investigation. Um, the Trump administration commenced its investigation into Amazon in 2019. Um, and the... Um, and that is, by the way, it's the Trump administration who started this. Um, and so uh, Jeff Bezos did not write nicely about right, Trump in, exactly. the, in the Washington Post, we should say. He has these amazing tweets where he's like, you know, the, the USPS has been playing delivery boy to Amazon and like they're getting a terrible deal. And, you know, it wasn't he wasn't wrong. Um, no, I mean, <laughs> you know, what? Deal. there was a, a, a broken clock. I mean, I don't care it, what his his motivation was. No. It was helpful. I mean, it would be so great if we could just have like Trump do social media for <laughs> for Lena Khan. Um, but uh, because I think that like, you know, in theory, he he kind of likes uh, he he wants to like a lot of what she does. But um, in any case, um, the uh, so if you're a small um, business, you'd love to kind of sell more over anybody but Amazon. Um, but you you can't induce your customers to do that by offering them lower prices. So that is what this is about. Um, it's it's really a practice on Amazon's part. Oh, and I should say what they do is they root out, uh, you know, of folks, uh, third party sellers who are charging discounts elsewhere, and then they just sort of suppress their search results. So they used to just kick you off entirely. Now they have this kind of much more insidious practice where they, um, you know, where, where they, they're constantly monitoring your, um, your prices everywhere all over the internet. And they have this kind of very um, detailed surveillance network. Um, and they, um, they just, you know, make it put your sales to zero, basically. Um, by using their algorithm, and um, this uh, this is very insidious. The by the way, the um, the delivery apps do this to restaurants as well. Um, it's a very um, common practice. But when you're dealing with um, a company like Amazon that has, you know, 83% market share according to the complaint in the uh, online superstore um, uh, space. Um, 
potentially 50, 55 percent of all e-commerce um, in, you know, in, that's, in the country. That's amazing. I mean, that's what Bezos set out to do. Right. He basically said, I want to replace everything. everything like i just like i want to be like you, you don't go if you're looking to buy something you don't go to google or any other search uh, thing you use amazon that becomes the sort of like intermediary to buy anything at any time um and and this is one of the practices that that makes it impossible for any other marketplaces uh to to get established Exactly. And, you know, it's one of those things that this practice in particular, um, because there's so many anti-competitive things that Amazon does, so many abuses that they um, that they perpetrate on, you know, both on, on mostly their third party sellers and their workers. Um, but this is this is an area where customers and uh, and small businesses sort of suffer equally. Um, so I think that it was a really strong case for them to kind of uh, may, uh, put at the centerpiece of their um, complaint, because we all know it. We all know that the same things that we purchased on Amazon, you know, four years ago are, you know, dramatically more expensive. We all know that it's much harder to find what you're looking for and that you get sort of assaulted with ads. Um, everybody sort of who uses Amazon and, you know, I'm one of those people, like I'm, I'm a mom of two small children. I can't not use Amazon. Um, <laughs> there's, I know a lot of good people who, um, who try to stay away from it entirely. Um, but it's very difficult, um, uh, for, you know, for, for some of us. And, and, and I, you know, think that it's the, the responsibility of the government to actually start to, um, legislate their practices. So, um, I, I thought that it was a great, um, it was a, it was a really good first step. I was really mad about the redactions. Um, the, well, the okay. Let's, <laughs> I don't think people know what you mean by that because, um, I, I was sort of hinting at it when I was introducing this is that it is, and, and this has happened in the Google case too. And it's sort of fascinating because of what, what happens because of these redactions, but just explain to us what, what you mean by redactions. So the complaint um, was released last week, but about one third of it was blacked out. Um, and it's, it's blacked out in this, it's not like full pages are blacked out. It'll be like, you know, four fifths of the page and then there'll be a random sentence. And um, so the, the act of just reading it was like very disorienting. And um, there was one section at the end um, on something called Project Nessie and everything besides Project Nessie, those, that word um, was, was blo uh, blacked out. So um, this is uh, something that the FTC it's in the rules that they sort of have to give the companies under investigation, um, you know, the right to redact, um, you know, within reason, um, I guess, or the right to redact anything that was obtained in the discovery process and in, in, uh, in the investment in the by civil investigative demand. So anything internal and um, a lot of really silly things um, ended up getting redacted. Now, um, the judge, John Chun, um, it's basically his discretion on whether he's going to keep these redactions permanent or um, or unseal um, uh, parts of this lawsuit um, pretty soon. In the Google case, which is um, occurring concurrently, there's a trial underway. And the judge in that case has been extremely um, deferential to Google's um, uh, desire to, um, you know, avoid embarrassment or what they call clickbait. Um, Google actually told the judge, oh, we don't really think that you need to make public any of these exhibits because, you know, it's, what's it going to do but produce clickbait? Well, clickbait is, you know, how you get the the nation, how you get um, Amazon customers, how you get, um, you know, readers and, and citizens um, engaged with you know, this story and how you kind of explain to them how these companies work. I think it's the most important thing. I've spent my life as a financial journalist and, um, you know, lawsuits, there's, there is, there's no freedom of information act for mon the monopolies that run your life. Wait, you why? No, we, so, so yeah. Wh where did this come from? Like, because this is, I mean, it seems to me like this is, um, if I was at the, you know, if I was at big monopoly uh, headquarters and ran their PR department, I would be like, this is, this is, this is our, this is basically how we keep, um, you know, maintaining monopolies is by not allowing stories essentially to be written about 
what the implications of these monopolies are and what we're able to do and, and this and that. Like, where did, is this statutory? Is it, uh, is it just like the way that the antitrust laws are written up or when were, when was this dynamic? Cause this dynamic doesn't really exist in the same way. If the DOJ was going after, you know, some like f criminal enterprise, they couldn't uh, hide some of the, they, the company would not have the ability to decide like, the benefit of the doubt is with us mm. in terms of what our company secrets that we can't uh, let people know. Right. So it, the, in this case, for, with the FTC, it is actually in the FTC's charter that they uh, that uh, according to the the sealing order, because it was the FTC who actually, um, uh, you know, uh, wrote the motion to seal in this case, and it's a temporary seal. Um, and and you know I I've spoke to spoken to some attorneys there, and this is actually in the FTC rules. Um, probably has something to do with the fact that like these, it, what, this wasn't um, you know tick, like traditional discovery that led to these um, revelations. A lot of them were you know they were civil investigative demands, which are some something different from subpoenas. Somehow I'm not a lawyer, so I um, I don't really understand fully the weeds um, there. But um, clearly a lot of it is discretionary. And it is, you know, you make these calculations, you choose your battles. In the case of the um, Google case, obviously, that is a trial. Um, the rules uh, ought to be very different in that case. The judge has certainly um, said things like, well, you know, I'm going to sort of, I, I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to be conservative. This company is telling me that, um, you know, this, that, that, that disclosure of these things would, um, you know, threaten to um, uh, expose competitive information. And to, to which I say, like, this is, a, this is a lawsuit about uh, anti-competitive activity. Like, what are I, you know, I don't, what do I care about your, you know, competitive secrets? Like, this is the whole point. Um, and, and, the, and the point is, too, is like, who's Google's competitor? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, right? like, like I mean, that's the whole that's point. That's the whole point. Why yes. we're here. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so it's a little bit different in that case. And I think that in that case, also the Justice Department um, bears some of the blame because I think that they have, uh, gone easy on on Google in hopes of I don't know making the proceeding more civil. I'm not sure um, obtaining a, a a better settlement when it you know it, if and when it comes to that. I don't know, but I know that the ju um, the Justice Department in that case shares some of the blame. And we have to remember we have some really great trust busters um, on uh, Team Biden, but. Ultimately, there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of lawyers that get involved in these things. And a lot of them um, have much more, uh, you know, conservative, uh, deferential, uh, you know, chicken chick club, you could call it, um, right. uh, you know, mentalities about what their jobs are. Um, and it's a shame. But um, what, you know, the public needs to get angry. And that's a sort of, I, you know, wrote a story entirely about the redactions in the Amazon case. I can't wait to get my hands on the, um, on the unredacted case. But um, I think we should be really angry that, you know, judges are um, allowing this. Um, this is, these are, you know, again, like I said, there's no Freedom of Information Act. This is our only chance um, to get, to, to, to really understand how business works. I have literally, uh, you know, all of my education in terms of understanding how our economy works, um, has has come through lawsuits, I would say. I mean, a, a major portion of that, um, because you know they they break the law all the time, and um, and nobody you know holds them accountable. And we're you know in the effort to do that, we we have to tell the public what they're doing. Um, so yes, uh, and, it, <laughs> and it seems like there's also sort of like we, you know, there has been a I think a. Uh, I mean, I think it's inarguable. There's been a definite turn in terms of like this administration and their perspective on antitrust. Like we are uh, th this administration and the personnel that have come in, particularly at the leadership, you know, like Khan and uh, over at uh, Cantor, uh, yeah. in Cantor, um, represent a a big return to uh, antitrust ideology, if you will, or perspective that existed 50 years ago pre Bork. Uh, when when this right. changed, but we still have it seems to me a system like any judge who is hearing these cases to the extent that they had any background in antitrust, it was under a completely different sort of like 
regime, if you will, and all of their training and all of their success in that industry was a function of the way it was set up then. And they're still operating on that. We, we're, we're 10, 15 years off from having judges who may even reflect the current sort of uh, perspective on antitrust. Yes, we have to, we are at the mercy of judges who have been systematically brainwashed, frankly. Um, you know, the, the, the anti-antitrust movement or the Chicago School of Law and Economics, I used to call it like law and anarchy because it's really a, 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 an ideology that sort of always ends up in the position of let the market sort it out. We don't, why do we need to be involved in this? And, uh, you know, that has been a project that dates back to the 50s um, in the starting around the 70s and and really getting you know strong in in the 80s you know we had george mason when we had university of chicago and and stanford and uh, you know a, a ton of um of you know pretty uh well uh well uh funded institutions holding you know retreats for judges uh, ex you know that were almost um you know completely staffed by economists um of course this is something that you know the university of chicago thought up well why don't we just get the economist to teach law school mm -hmm. um you know that's that's sort of where it started and these economists were all kind of right wing and of the mentality that and i trust is silly and it's it's this sort of unjust intrusion in the market and um and so we're we're going to be dealing with the legacy of this for some time um because that it, they've been you know thousands of judges have gone through these programs um lived in this paradigm um you know must um sort of uh comply with these precedents that have been ha have been set um by the supreme court and and you know um appeals courts that really really limit what you can do um in terms of antitrust enforcement and that's how lena got her start um in the amazon cases with her landmark 2017 paper uh, amazon's antitrust paradox um really goes into how the entire business model of amazon and by the way the rest of silicon Valley, Uber, DoorDash, you know, all the rest of, of those, um, those companies, this, those money burning companies, right? Um, this was illegal predatory pricing, the, um, the idea that you would um, set your prices on something so low that you would run every potential competitor out of the market. That was, a you know, straight up, you know, uh, obviously central casting, restraint of trade, um, very much um, something that wasn't done um, and was, as you know, in until the, the 80s. Um, then a series of Supreme Court decisions really um, uh, raised the threshold for proving that predatory pricing was happening to this bar that was like almost impossible to uh, to meet. So um, so Amazon sort of took advantage of that and 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 you know pounced into this market where um, you know this this new paradigm where predatory pricing law was not enforced in any meaningful way, and um, and and did exactly that. They you know they they told Wall Street, hey, we're making a monopoly. Um, you know uh, you you better just fund us. We're we're not going to uh, turn a profit at any you know anytime soon so don't ask us to um and but we will give you growth and we will make sure that nobody else can succeed in in doing anything that we try to do and they've really been um unbelievably successful and now we're sort of paying the bill you know the bills for that everybody loves amazon because they give us something that we didn't, you know, used to be able to get, which is free delivery on everything. Um, but, you know, who's paid the price for that? You know, obviously the Postal Service has paid the price. Um, cities and towns, um, they, you know, for, for 20 years, they didn't charge sales taxes. Um, so that was like an unfair advantage. There's tons of subsidies that Amazon has gotten to, um, in addition to the subsidy of, of not having to comply with predatory pricing law. Um, over the years that, um, that, you know, are now the bills come due for that. And, and, you know, sellers are paying the price and consumers are finally paying the price. And, you know, I think that we all get that there needs to, this, this needs to be, um, this needs to be regulated. And, and I, and I want to just like, you know, uh, emphasizing, you know, when you say uh, brainwash, like the analogy to me is sort of like what we saw with doctors. I mean, surely there were some bad actors, uh, you know, in terms of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who would, um, uh, prescribe, but like the, the, uh, you know, the, the Oxycontin, uh, thing, like, you know, doctors were told that this stuff was 
somehow non-addictive now because of the way that, that it was constructed. And there was, you know, a generation of doctors who that's what they were told in the, in the context of like right. law school, if you bring in economics and you bring in an economist, these would be lawyers are sitting there and, and economics is treated as if it was like a, a pure science as right. opposed to <laughs> uh, an ideology. Right. And they come in and go like, this is how nature works. And the lawyers are there right. and they like, I don't know any debt, and I'm just going to assume. Yeah, like a real thing. Um, No, it's it's very similar to that. And, uh, you know, frankly, it involved a lot of the same people. The Cato Institute um, in the late 90s um, was gung-ho about, you know, how we had this puritanical um, you know, uh, relationship, the, me- you know, the medical, uh, community had this puritanical relationship with painkillers and really we needed to just like, you know, there was this epidemic of undertreated pain, all of the same guys who were, you know, telling you that antitrust was, um, obsolete and, and pointless. Um, a lot of them were also, um, you know, chilling, uh, for Oxycontin, um, and, you know, against climate change and all of that stuff. It's the same, the same old guys and, you know, probably a lot of the same, the same tactics, you know, why need wine and dine these people who are lawyers and doctors who, you know, are, are affluent, but they, they're certainly not, you know, hedge fund manager rich. And you give these guys a little extra money to speak at your convention or mm-hmm. to, you know, to, to, you just give them a, a, a fancy golf weekend and, you know, it works very well. And the side of, of, you know, small business and workers, um, and, and, you know, people who are just sort of antitrust geeks, <laughs> like, uh, like, you know, Lena Khan and, and I've gotten to be one to an extent. Um, uh, we obviously don't have the resources to do that. Um, but it's, um, uh, you know, so a lot of it is we're relying on, um, judges sort of, uh, realizing that this has happened. And as in medicine, a lot of doctors realized that they had been brainwashed, that they, you know, that they listened to that, that, that pharmaceutical companies are always trying to brainwash them. Um, it's a little harder in the cases with judges because they maybe have a, you know, high, higher opinion of their own, um, uh, objectivity. My experiences with lawyers would indicate that that's the yeah. case. But uh, uh, that said, are there, do you, uh, being a, a self-professed uh, antitrust nerd, do you um, see any political constituencies that are growing, um, that, that are out there that are maybe just sort of like, you see, maybe starting to congeal? And what would those look like? And also, is there any effort within the context of the institution of law to sort of like push this? Like, I know that, you know, uh, the, we have the Federalist Society, which I'm sure has its own sort of like division of maintaining uh, the the purity of the Borkian view of antitrust. Is there anything on the sort of antitrust side that is attempting to sort of educate at the law school level? Yeah, well, I would say that there is a they call it the I think the Wall Street Journal has called it hipster antitrust. Um, I think that um, uh, Lena Khan is basically considered the um, what, what would you call her? <laughs> like the Lana Del Rey of hipster antitrust. Um, <laughs> so trying, to avoid, trying to avoid making a Taylor Swift reference. Um, Thank you. It's very difficult. Like <laughs> she's, she's like the Amazon of pop culture references. Um, but, uh, but yes, so there is right. I, and I should say I'm in addition to the investigations editor of the American prospect, I'm a fellow at the American economic liberties project, which is a group that um, was formed by um, folks who, uh, you know, initially they were at the new American foundation and then they sort of got silenced um, by Google, which was a, a funder. And they realized that they needed to stop taking money from Google. And, um, and, and if they wanted to, you know, really achieve any of their policy goals. And so I think that this, there is a certainly a concerted movement. Um, I meet law students all the time who are interested in antitrust. It's, it's, it definitely is, is sexy, um, in a certain realm of, um, of law student, um, in a way that like was, un- is unthinkable like uh, 10 years ago, 10 uh, years I- ago. I went to uh, law school uh, for a year, uh, I guess it was about 30 years ago, and 
I don't think I ever heard anybody talk about antitrust. I don't even think I heard their words antitrust uh, the entire time I was there. It just was not something that was discussed right. in the, the 90s. It was just not an issue. No, it's, it was very, yeah, it's, it was extremely niche. And honestly, the only people, you know, it was like one of those things that had, by, by the time the 90s came around, it was like something that M&A lawyers cared about, right? Like it was something that they kind of gave them work to do, gave them billable hours. Um, because there was, you know, there was always like a few divestments that they would have to do when they wanted to do a merger. Um, but it uh, is, I think that there's, you know, so there's a movement, but there's nothing like, nobody there isn't some giant like pool of money um so that's that's going to be be the problem but i think that it's it's got a you know it's sort of like the pmc labor movement i i would say in terms of it's it certainly feels like it's ascendant um in a way that i would never have imagined 10 years ago like i like the same way that i would never imagine to like I would never have imagined 10 years ago, sort of like in the aftermath or like, you know, 12 years ago, like kind of during um, the like Tea Party backlash um, to the Obama administration that, um, and, and Scott Walker's um, union busting, like that, that we would have a, a, you know, a whole bunch of strikes happening all the time. Um, but, and, and that there would be this, um, you know, militant labor movement that was um, extremely popular. Um, I think that there is a similar trajectory um, with antitrust um, among, you know, kind of the, the types of people who go to law school. So that is the, th the one thing that gives me um, hope. But, you know, again, like these these companies have a lot of money. The only thing that I, you know, and, and what I'll say is that they're legal, like when you le read their responses when you read their lawsuits again you know that it, it they're not impressive um the 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 ideology that you know the theories that destroyed antitrust enforcement in this country were never impressive they were always baby brain bullshit um but you know they had they had all the the money on their right. side so that uh, there's a lot of that I, th I find uh, on, on a lot of uh, issues, frankly. Uh, Mo Tatic, uh, Investigations Editor at the American Prospect. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, great to talk to you always about this stuff. And um, as we get uh, less redaction, uh, hopefully we'll have you back and find out, uh, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> what Project Nessie is. <laughs> the first Project Nessie sounds, awesome. it has to do with, I'm convinced, like something that's underwater, right? <laughs> like Loch Ness. Ooh. Right? Yes. I, yeah, I think that that was one of the, you know, it's sort of like Enron, like nicknamed all of its um, off balance sheet vehicles after Darth Vader and, you know, the Star Wars characters, Chewie and Raptor. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that that is. And I think that's one of the reasons that the FTC <laughs> put it in the lawsuit because I think they couldn't resist. But um, yeah, there's a story in the Wall Street Journal about what exactly is Project Nessie today. I'm still not entirely I still don't understand it, but you know, um, there's a lot more to come in this one. So I would imagine if the wall street journal is writing about it, it's almost, uh, it, it is almost specifically designed to take anyone's guesses, uh, in a, in the wrong direction is my, exactly. uh, is my guess. But, um, uh, Mo Tatsik, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Always. Uh, all right, folks, we're going to take a uh, quick break. Head into the uh, fun half of the program. Went a little long today, of course. All good. Hump day. Oh, Wednesday yeah. hump day. Lots of news today. And uh, We need to uh, uh, break up Amazon. And we need to uh, break up uh, Google. I mean, we just need to. And we need to... Um, and then have the post office run the uh, biggest parts of them. Bless you. Thank right. You. I mean, but we need to pull apart the real problem, it seems to me, at the heart of a lot of this, is just sort of like advertising. You can be in the advertising business, but you can't be in the other business because the other business becomes secondary and just becomes a way of, of feeding into the advertising business. Yeah. And I, that, uh, you know, providing data, I, it's just not good. Well, how are we going to get this money to shareholders? I mean, which is all the businesses are for. <laughs> yeah. Um, what did I, oh, uh, we'll get into the, uh, that, uh, I'll remind people at the 220 thing uh, later. 
Um, I, I just, uh, I wanted to just one mention uh, one thing. We, you know, one of the things that has always been important to me about this show from the, the day that we launched it on Air America, you know, almost 19, well, no, almost 20 years ago, uh, was the community that we built online that where the show just became sort of a, a, I don't know, a watershed that people could come and bounce off of. Um, and very often just a, a function of the members of the community. I mean, uh, we set up a movable type blog in 2004 and uh, basically just stepped back. <laughs> and uh, we were having, you know, a thousand comments an hour on, uh, on a blog at that time. Um, the, the, the show continues to do that. And now it's, you know, largely in our Discord and IMs. And, and, but we've had many people over the years who've been a part of the show, have contributed by calling in. Uh, started their stuff and we lost a member of that community and I just found out about it and apparently he passed in June um, I'm sure a lot of people remember Jeff in Georgia uh, he had a uh, a podcast dissident peasant dissident peasant which uh, I think is still available um, a history podcast that you know I learned a lot of stuff uh, from that and people should check it out uh, and I just wanted to you know uh, mark his uh, passing uh, a young guy, and uh, I'm not really clear on exactly what um, uh, what it was, but he was uh, he had he was struggling with the illness for an extended period of time, and uh, so I just wanted to uh, give a show far out to Jeff in Georgia. Um, rest in peace. Yes, rest in peace, uh, Jeff. Uh, I think he he had some uh, some difficulties. Uh, towards the end there and I know he was he was dealing with some illness so but uh, really appreciate his contributions to the show and um, uh, just sad to find out yeah um, Emma yes what's happening on ESVN on ESVN yeah we we gave a, a breakdown about uh, week three or week four actually in the NFL uh, on Monday although excluding the excruciating uh, Giants loss which I witnessed later that evening I'll talk more about that on Thursday uh, we'll, it'll be a solo episode because Bradley's not going to be around but we'll still ha have him give his picks against the spread uh, youtube.com slash ESVN show on Thursday for that Matt yeah, last night on Left Reckoning, a uh, bit of a heavier show. I uh, talked with uh, journalist Alice Sperry on her article in The Intercept about uh, Russian, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and Bucha, um, or Bucha and the uh, issues with sexual violence there uh, under the occupation and then the issues with some of the victims of that being um, accused of collaboration after um, the liberation. So uh, Patreon.com is Left Reckoning. We also... Uh, talked a little bit about what's going on in Texas, where there's a new race panic uh, mm -hmm. going on, if you can believe it. There's some Mexicans living there in Texas, and the uh, Texas legislature, Republicans are on it. Uh, so we talked about that. So patreon.com slash left reckoning. Just a reminder, it's your show. It's your support that makes the show possible. You can become a member. Join the majority report.com. When you do, you get the free show, free of commercials, and then you get the fun half, all the benefits that come with that. Uh, and also don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, head back, and fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Anarchy. Alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back, back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, 
Sam Cedar. What a wow, what a fucking nightmare. Nightmare. Yeah, or a couple of them just put them in rotation. 